Welcome to the 1957 Nobel Prize in Physics, which is unique. You'll see this little unassuming, subtle looking paper here uh, with a date on it that uh, says 1956. You might go, wait a minute. That can't be the paper. That actually is the paper they wrote that won them the prize just one year later. So normally these things take years and years and years. This time everyone went, oh, my God, this stuff is great. And it won the prize the next year. So it was jointly awarded to uh, professors Yang and Lee for their work on the parity laws, which led to amazing discoveries in the field of elementary uh, particles. So it kind of launched a lot of our current thinking on particle physics. So just a little topic. Sorry, physics joke, you got to take them where you can get them. Um, but this one could get deep. So we could do a full on graduate level seminar on this stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I could do, I will do a video on that someday, but I, I'm not going to do that to people today because we want to keep this sort of at a, a level where everybody can kind of understand it. But let, let's dive in here. So why does it matter that they wrote this little paper? And why is that the sort of thing that just sort of took everybody by storm. Because what they did was they took theories that had kind of stood forever and they took assumptions everybody made on the way stuff worked. And they said, that's not right. And they threw it out the window and they said, here's what's actually right. So it took a lot of stuff that was sort of, everybody just knew this was correct. Everybody just knew this was the way it worked. And they said, no, no, not really. It's actually this other way. Um, and they had to take people who were Enrico Fermi and Einstein and others and sort of say, okay, you know, you're not quite exactly it. In fact, Lee uh, himself worked for, for Fermi for a while. Uh, Fermi, if you remember, won the Nobel Prize in 1938. Uh, Lee won the prize when he was only 31 years old. Uh, Professor Yang, who's still alive today, Lee just passed away earlier this year. Uh, Professor Yang is 102 years old. He's still, he's still around. The, um, uh, but uh, he was also around Fermi quite often at the University of Chicago, uh, but he actually got his PhD under a guy named Edward Teller. Edward Teller was sort of the grandfather of the hydrogen bomb. You might have seen him running around, the character running around in the movie Oppenheimer. Uh, so let's dive in and see what these guys did to sort of turn the physics world on its, on its head. So for years before these guys came along, physicists believed that symmetries were just all over in nature. So if you have this blob of particles and you sort of get a center of mass, you get symmetries right and left and right. Um, you know, you've got, you know, humans are symmetric. So of course everything else must be. Uh, but it, it, we, we, they thought we lived in a world where left and right were reversed and everything that applied to the left applied to the right. In a physical sense, you could replace this with antimatter anti and matter and say, well, what exists for one exists for the other. And they're exactly the same, but opposite. Right. So that kind of made sense to just make those assumptions. It certainly made the math a lot easier. Um, that doesn't make it correct. It just makes it easier. So nature doesn't care about your assumptions. So we made these assumptions and there was a problem with those assumptions because certain decay particles, when you look at fundamental particle physics, when things fall apart with a nuclear fission world. So I remember we, we just came out of all those nuclear awards where things fall apart. They emit beta particles, emit alpha particles, all kinds of little particles come flying out. Um, and uh, when certain ones fall apart, you expect it to do it in a certain way with a certain symmetry. So sometimes that didn't happen. Sometimes particle decay didn't pay attention to what our assumptions were. I mean, what the heck, particles? Can't somebody tell them that, hey, our assumptions are perfect and they need to decay the way we tell them to, right? By the way, those assumptions are always not always bad. Sometimes they're right, but sometimes assumptions can lead you astray. I'm looking at you, dark matter, looking at you, you know, string theory, maybe quantum loop. Okay. You see where I'm going with this. Anything that comes up with this just large list of overall assumptions, you know, sometimes nature doesn't care, right? There's always, there may be a simpler answer to it. And what these guys did was they came along and said, Hey, symmetry doesn't work. It's, it's not always that way. So one assumption uh, uh, can be, Great, but you always have to take your assumptions in physics and test them and test them over and test them again and test them again. Because if you make some of them wrong, you get really wrong answers and you don't want that. Uh, so what these guys did was they came along and said, hey, you know, you're trying to figure out how to make a theory fit an observation that doesn't really. So there were certain decay chains that just weren't paying attention to symmetry, right? They just didn't care. Things would decay the way you, the, the math said they shouldn't. But there it was in the data. You look at it. So, of course, the gut instinct of a physicist is, well, I'll just come up with a more complicated theory that makes that correct, right? Because we want to force the math to fit the observation. Don't change the assumptions, right? We have to keep those assumptions the same. Let's just come up with far more complex math. Um, it's just sort of a reaction. Uh, but... So they they didn't view it that way. They viewed a problem with symmetry when you get down to certain types of decay chains in the very smallest parts of the the the, uh, the world. Uh, and so they wrote this letter uh, to Wolfgang Pauli. Remember, Pauli won the Nobel Prize in 1945. 
Uh, and he, he they, these two sent a proposal to him that said, hey, look, we, we want to go and, and kind of attack these violations of symmetry. And, of course, it was met with skepticism. Paulie's like, yeah, right, whatever. We all know symmetry's right. You guys, you don't know what you're doing. I'm the good one. You're not. And then at the time, basically everyone in the field kind of said, hey, fundamental forces all obeyed symmetry. Uh, electromagnetism, gravity, strong force, the weak force, they all obeyed these symmetric laws. So, of course, this can't be right. This throws out all the stuff we've been talking about forever. Well, just a few days later, of course, along comes somebody and says, hey, I've got some data that doesn't necessarily fit symmetry. Uh, and then everybody went, hey, wait a minute. Here's a problem. We've got a thing that doesn't really fit. Now we've got data and we've got these guys over here saying one thing and what's going on. Then uh, on October 1st of 1956, these two guys published their paper, um, which spawned a debate and intense series of experiments uh, that went on to say, hey, are these guys right or are all the assumptions we've made for years to be right? So what they did was they took a risk, which is something not a lot of scientists do today. They said, hey, look, all those assumptions made before were wrong. And they didn't just say, hey, I think they're wrong. Therefore, you know, here's this other hand wavy answer. They got down and dirty, right? They went in and said, hey, I'm going to go through and solve the math for you. And I'm going to show you a proof, not based on the assumption, but based on what we think is really going on. And that math happens to fit with some things. So what did that math really show us? Well, let's take a little bit of a look. So prior to these guys, there was this thing called the theta tau puzzle, which were two particles, which we now are two different particles, which at the time that people were like, this is something that's not fitting. But we now know them as, as kaons, uh, which, you know, appear to undergo sort of different decays. Uh, so everybody went, well, what the heck? Can someone, you know, tell these particles to do what they're supposed to do? Well, it didn't work, right? So the decay being different meant either the theory was wrong or some experiments were just wrong. So in, in May of 1956, these guys pretty much had their theory worked out and they were sending out some sort of preprints, some early drafts of their paper to people going, hey, look, can you check this for us? This happens a lot in science. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, there are people who will never send a science, a, a paper out for people to you know, sort of check for them and see if they're gone crazy because they're afraid to get ripped off. I, I get that. But, you know, if you're, if you're doing some groundbreaking work, sometimes you want to have somebody come behind you and go, hey, look, are you nuts? Am I nuts? Have I talked myself into this or is this right? So uh, a doctor named Wu um, and her team at Columbia had, had, had sort of advanced notice of the theory and they showed it to, uh, to be absolutely true. So they used cobalt 60. And by December of that year, they had enough data to demonstrate that parity violation could be shown experimentally. So they didn't quite make when the paper was released, when, when these two gentlemen had, had put their paper out, but she had early data of it. And certainly they were in communication. Uh, and she was like, Hey, we're starting to see stuff that makes it real. And by December of that year, um, they uh, they certainly had it. So uh, it was nice for them to get that experimental uh, evidence so fast. Now, Dr. Wu uh, actually worked on the Manhattan Project. She, she did a lot of interesting stuff over the years. She never did win a Nobel Prize. She was nominated a number of times from what I could find, but I don't know why she never got across the finish line with it. But she was the first to do uh, the experimental observation of their theory. They won for the theory, uh, but she did do it with Cobalt-60. Uh, now, what what I think this prize shows us is that right now physics in a lot of ways is kind of stuck. We've got, you know, quantum mechanics and relativity aren't quite lining up. There's some people come up with string theory, quantum loop gravity, and all this other stuff that's untestable. Uh, and, you know, we say, well, oh, that's right. You just can't test it. Well, that's not really the way of science, right? So are all those things correct or are we just kidding ourselves? Relativity seems to hold pretty much everywhere you can test it, except when you get to black holes and a few other places. But quantum mechanics is all that probabilistic stuff we've talked about that seems like it's on really shaky ground lately because there's got to be something more underneath that that's more that's more solid and less statistical in nature. Uh, so at least a lot of people seem to think, oh, I think so. Einstein thought so. So did a bunch of others. Uh, but the quantum theorists have kind of like put a stranglehold on everybody for years, but I think that's starting to break. Uh, so what these guys did was they took that sort of, hey, everybody knows this to be right, and they turned it up on its edge, and they proved that it wasn't. And I think the world of physics is really kind of ready for another one of those sort of revolutions. Uh, this one was, you know, 30, uh, 70 years ago, but um, it uh, certainly, you know, we're right for another one. Uh, so please don't forget to click like and subscribe. I will dig into this particular one. Once we're finished with the Nobel Prizes in Physics, I'll go start going back, doing a little bit more in-depth details of some of their work. And this one is certainly one that when we get into that, the math is going to make your head explode. I apologize for that, but it, it just is what it is.
I will be careful with the math and try to explain it very carefully. Uh, but please don't forget to click like and subscribe. It does help us out with the algorithms. And we will see you on the next one.